Hey everybody, welcome back to This Week in Global Health, which is otherwise known as TWIG, which is a regular video series that discusses relevant and current topics in global health. In this episode, we are continuing our series featuring leading topics coming out of the latest publications in the Disease Control Priorities Network, and today we're going to focus on household air pollution. I'm Jessica Taff, and I'm hosting this show today from the Washington, D.C. metro area. And with me to discuss this important issue, we have two experts. I'm um, Jay Pillarsetti. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley, and I co-authored a couple of the chapters in the environmental health or environmental um, in the Environmental DCP3 volume. Uh, one, an overview of household air pollution, and the second, extended cost effectiveness analysis of household air pollution interventions in India. Yes, and I'm uh, Professor Kirk Smith at the School of Public Health at the University of California in Berkeley, and I've worked on household air pollution issues for um, nearly 40 years. So I remember reading from this chapter that almost 3 billion people worldwide use solid cook fuels, despite over 100 years um, of the advent of cleaner fuels. So tell me, why is this important from a public health point of view? Well, the burning of the solid fuels is um, basically either coal, uh, which is largely used in China, and our biomass, which is used all over the developing world. It's um, an issue of poverty. Um, people, poor people use these fuels. And the problem with them is that um, in spite of uh, many people thinking that the burning of wood uh, produces a smoke that is non-toxic, or uh, it actually there are a range of toxic materials in this smoke, and um, including particulate matter and carbon monoxide and um, um, various carcinogens. So it actually produces a very high exposure and that means the, the amount of pollution that people breathe because it's indoors um, in, uh, often and it's the uh, vulnerable populations of women and children that are exposed. Um, and exposure to PM in village homes can be orders of magnitude higher than in clean cities like San Francisco, New York, DC, Los Angeles. It can be even higher than concentrations in 30 cities like Beijing and Delhi. And so we're often seeing levels that are um, milligrams of air pollution per cubic meter. That's how we measure these things, a massive pollutant per volume of air. Um, whereas in a clean city, you might see levels as high as 20 or 30 micrograms per uh, cubic meter. So it's a huge range that you see in village households. So there's a lot of air pollution that's coming from household um, households, hence why we're calling it household air pollution. And this is a major risk factor for health. So I, I, I also find that it's among the, the most important environmental health risk factors globally, and it causes three to four million premature deaths annually. That's, that's such a, a huge amount. What are the, so, uh, the health and socio, um, what are the health and socioeconomic impacts of household air pollution? And what are some of the diseases that are linked to household air pollution? So the, those estimates come from the IHME, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluations, Global Burden of Disease Effort, and they link air pollution with five outcomes, lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, heart disease and stroke in adults, and lower respiratory infection or pneumonia in children. And there's also a lot of evidence linking household air pollution with tuberculosis, low birth weight, and other pregnancy outcomes, and neurocognitive issues. And there's still research going on uh, with those specific endpoints. So uh, these um, diseases are the same ones that are associated with other forms of air pollution exposure. Outdoor air pollution finds the same diseases. And even active smoking, sticking burning stuff in your mouth, which produces very high exposures to air pollution, also produces these. These are the main diseases caused by smoking. Of course, um, at much higher risk levels. Um, obviously a smoker is getting huge doses of pollution and therefore has a higher risk, but it's the same set of diseases. And in fact, household air pollution is sort of in between these two other forms of pollution, the outdoor air pollution levels and the active smoking levels. And the risks are correspondingly in between as well. Um, but um, one way of thinking about it is that in terms of the amount of pollution produced that a typical open cook fire in a village house in India, for example, might produce three or 400 cigarettes an hour worth of smoke. That doesn't mean the woman is smoking 
it's like the woman is smoking the cigarettes. It means it's like having that many cigarette smokers over for dinner, a very smoky pub kind of level. But this is every, you know, every, all of these houses, two or three times a day with some very vulnerable populations um, in, in the household, including babies and elderly people and pregnant women and so on. Right now, following up on the different types of air pollution um, in this chapter, and I think you, you, it specifically mentioned that you're defining and using the term household air pollution as opposed to the term indoor air pollution, which I think probably more people are familiar with and has been written about already. Um, how are these things different in the way that you guys are talking about them in the chapter? And what are the implications of so-called dirty fuel beyond the kitchen? So we transitioned from using the term indoor air pollution or indoor air quality for this specific um, issue to household air pollution because the while the combustion starts indoors, it leaves the house. It leaves the house through the windows, through the chimneys if there's one available, through openings, um, ends up outside. And in China and India, it's been estimated that between a quarter and a half of ambient air pollution, that is outdoor air pollution, comes from households. It originates from the combustion of solid fuels in households. Um, so we think it's a big contributor to outdoor air pollution in addition to the exposure it causes indoors. Yeah, and basically another um, a related reason is that calling it indoor air pollution sort of implies that just putting it outdoors would fix it. But we now understand that just putting it outdoors doesn't fix it. It goes comes in back in the bedroom, it goes to the neighbors, it goes down the street, and it eventually becomes part of outdoor air pollution. And so uh, China, for example, is now embarking on a um, set of uh, interventions to reduce the amount of household coal used and biomass used because of mainly a concern with outdoor pollution. So household was the best uh, um, other term we could think of that represents the problem but doesn't imply that it's all indoors. Now, I have a good friend from India, and I talked to her a little bit about the subject. Um, as you know, I know, I know, well, like you said, India is definitely taking a strong stance on trying to address this problem. Um, and she had mentioned to me how in villages and even in some of the slums in northern India, it was really common to see cow dung dried and stuck on the wall. And that was used as, as fuel. And I know in the chapter, you guys talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, animal animal dung being used as fuel so now this really and i think this is i find this 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 topic really interesting because i think you know it, it really comes down it's a very you have to address it with typical public health interventions um and, and particularly it's going to be about addressing behavior change and changing habits but it's also a development issue so you know I want to, I'm wondering, do you think this is a, is that, is it really that simplistic um, or is there really more to this? It's a great question. Um, one, one might think that over a long enough time frame, development will just take care of this issue. And if we look at the example of India, we can see that there've been about 700 million people using solid fuels for cooking um, now, and as there were two, three decades ago. So. It's been, we've been kind of stuck. While the proportion of people using solid fuels has decreased, the absolute number has stayed constant. And that indicates that people are stuck in what Kirk and others have called the chula trap. Chula, in this case, being the Hindi word for a biomass cook stove, that there's this base population that just can't get out of using biomass in these simple stoves, um, regardless of all the development that's been going on in India. So there are basically two two ways, uh, or, um, three ways to deal with this problem that have been addressed in the past. One is to, to, to sort of hope that development will take care of it, but that's been clear that this is not working. Actually, the number of people using um, solid fuels is about the same in India, has been for 30 or 40 years. The number in Sub-Saharan Africa is going up. Every year there are more people using solid fuels, so waiting for development to occur has not solved the problem. Now, China, perhaps the levels of solid fuel use are going down, but they're going down slowly. So, and you know, much of them, um, um, so we are, uh, uh, the second level way of dealing with the problem is to try to make these uh, fuels cleaner, um, you know, burn them in a more efficient way with the so-called advanced or improved biomass stoves. This we call this making the available clean, the available biomass clean. But this has turned out also to be quite difficult. There've been, so-called improved stove programs now for, well, since the 1950s in India. You know, with a big increase in the number of them in the last 
a decade or two. And, and the, uh, at the same time, we understand the health effects much better and, and realize that things have to be really clean in a household in order to get the health benefits we need. And so we're still hoping that there'll be uh, advanced stoves that are clean enough, but to date, none of them really are. But there's a third option, which is what we um, are pushing ourselves these days. And that is instead of making the available clean, why not make the clean available? Because we know what the clean fuels are. It's what all three of us use, it's gas or electricity. 60% of the world uses gas or electricity to cook. It's clean, it cooks every cuisine fine, it's aspirational, it's what people are striving for. Problem is that they, uh, these fuels have been not have been available to the poor, and so our efforts now are focused on trying to make them available to the poor, so making the clean available. Well, I understand that there are programs that there there are heavy, uh, there are sub subsidies to encourage using clean energy, um, clean energy like um, liquefied petroleum gas. But even when they when there are countries that have this these subsidies, it's still not getting people. There's still so many people that are using the biomass fuel. For instance, in India, the 2011 census estimated that 85 percent of um, all rural, rural households, which is about 142 million, depends entirely on this, the biomass fuel, which is like the, we talked about the cow dung or wood for, uh, for cooking. Um, so why do you think that there's, it's been challenging even when there are these options like the subsidies to promote using cleaner fuel? Uh, another great question. Um, moving people to clean cooking is pretty tough, so it requires changes in policy and behavior, and then importantly, steady supplies of clean fuel or electricity. So you can imagine that um, we hear cases where people have to commute maybe an hour or two hours in each direction with their heavy LPG cylinder to get it refilled and they get there and maybe the shops close or they can't get their refill for some reason. And so there's a tremendous burden um, for people to go and deal with sort of the supply issue. And so, you know, India's made a lot of progress in that regard. Um, both through making supplies more accessible broadly and then through some innovative policy programs. And one of them that we think is the most innovative is called the Give It Up program. And it asks house, uh, middle and upper class households to give up their subsidy, which is then retargeted one to one to poor households. And so far, around 11 million people have given up, or 11 million households have given up their subsidy, which is around a $1 billion so called internal foreign aid program. So it's you know, something that's directly happening um, where you're seeing a transfer from wealthy and middle class families to look poor families and pretty rare for that kind of thing to happen for a voluntary give up of a subsidy. And we think one of the reasons it works is because you're not giving the money back to the government, which not necessarily anyone wants to do, but you're instead giving the money to people in your country. You're helping improve the social welfare of the country. Yeah, one of the reasons this is possible in India now, um, in addition to um, you know a policy environment that is uh, uh, receptive to it, is that um, information technology, IT technology, is making it possible. You can now look on a website and see the name of the poor person that got, got your subsidy that you just gave up, and um, you. Uh, this is all done through um, you know. Um, the, uh, India has a ID system called the Aadhaar system that has a digital. Um, uh, has your thumbprint and a digital iris scan. It's very difficult to be pretend to be somebody you're not. So you can target the subsidies much better than you can uh, used to be able to. Also, almost everybody has electronic bank accounts. The, the bank transfers are very uh, inexpensive, you know. Um, and also, again, it's very difficult to um, get a bank account unless you have an Aadhaar card. So the uh, bank accounts are really associated with the individual households. So, so this is part of a general plan in the, in the Indian government of digitalization or digital India, they call it. It's a way to bring in um, the rural population, the vast rural population into the economy in, in an efficient way. Um, you're moving now toward cashless transactions where you're paying by PayPal or that kind of thing. Uh, there are a number of different programs um, so it's it's meeting, it's actually, it's part of the national policy plan for the, the country. This and LPG has, um, has uh, been noted as being leading the way. And uh, right now they're in the middle of a program, as Ajay mentioned, that is, is uh, going to reach um, 50, 60 million households by 2019. That's 350 million people. I mean, this is a huge number. And 
right now, I mean, last week it was 35 million. I think they are going to meet this goal, but that's providing access to the fuel. And as we know, uh, just providing access to things doesn't necessarily mean that people will use them. Of course, it's a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. In the health field, we, we know just giving people access to condoms or access to bed nets or access to latrines or any number of other health new health technologies doesn't necessarily mean that people use them instantly 100% of the time. So much of the research and effort that our group does and others in India is to promote usage. You can't have usage without access and the Indian government has found a way to provide access, but we still need to promote usage. Absolutely. And I, you know, I have to say, I really liked reading about the, uh, what would you say? The, the give it, the give, give it, it up, give campaign. it up, give it up. Yeah. The give it up campaign. Um, I thought, you know, it's, I, I like that approach kind of, it's, it's more positive reinforcement, you know, you're getting to see who you're helping out and, and feeling you're actually making a difference. Yeah. A remarkable Sorry. response by the Indian population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Um, the other intervention I know that's covered in the chapter are induction stoves. And I remember reading that this is actually in the, the newer stuff that's coming out is can be more cost effective and um, cooking with this. So uh, tell us a little more about this. I mean, how how is this getting implemented and what are the challenges regarding that and in, um, in different places? So, yeah, I'll, I'll let Kirk tackle the induction stove issue and I'll just talk a little bit about some of the challenges in, in pushing out clean cooking um, through various ministries and pathways. So in India, they're, we think, the first country in the world to put air pollution on the health agenda. So it's not an issue for an energy ministry or an environment ministry, but it's actually on the Ministry of Health's current agenda. And that isn't just household air pollution, it's all types of air pollution, but um, it does include, of course, household air pollution. And we think for a lot of positive progress to continue, we, there needs to be the right set of policy tools to incentivize households to transition to near exclusive use of clean fuels. And so that means doing whatever we can to ease the friction for the household for them to actually transition completely to clean cooking. Um, and as we've been talking about, it's not really just a technology issue, but it's one of marketing and communications and thinking about sort of the entire system and the sort of energy services that a household needs. Yes, um, induction stoves um, do look like uh, probably the technology of the future. Um, but that, you say India is not doesn't have a program of promoting induction stoves. If they are picking up a bit in the in the uh, normal market. You see them for sale everywhere in um, Delhi and um, and you in certain states of the country that have quite reliable electricity. For example, Kerala. Um, induction stoves are coming in quite strongly just through nat natural forces, um, uh, market forces. There are, there are countries though, Ecuador in particular, uh, is a country that is changing out every stove in the country to induction stoves. And the reason for that is they already changed out to gas about 20 years ago and they're now um, want to um, move from gas, which is, requires them to import the gas and to subsidize it to use local electricity sources, local hydropower sources. So they call it green cooking. But in fact, I think um, uh, it's part of the process the entire world is going through. Um, eventually, you know, due to climate considerations and, uh, and resource constraints, we want everybody to be using mainly electric uh, appliances in their homes and their vehicles and, and so forth everywhere we can. And that electricity can be powered by renewables, you know, wind and solar. That's what we want to head for. Um, gas is a, a transition fuel. It's better, a lot better than solid fuels, coal or biomass. And that's what we use in this country, in the US, to, as this transition, we use cook with gas um, or electricity made with gas. But in the long run, we're going to be shifting to electric, um, uh, almost all our tasks powered by electricity and presumably one hopes with um, solar and wind powered electricity. Well, India can do that too, um, or other countries. They can um, use a gas, in this case, LPG, not natural gas. Natural gas requires pipelines, which LPG does not, making it much more flexible. And then in the long run, also move to electric cooking. But this is a, a ways off yet. I mean, we're seeing the first sign of it in Ecuador and, and in a few in particular places like parts of India, but it isn't yet taking off widely. 
So in the chapter, it covers a bunch of, you know, like a lot, a lot of the diseases that are associated with household air pollution. Now, what countries are um, actually have this largest burden of these diseases that are caused by uh, household air pollution? And in these countries, what are they doing to address the problem? Um, do we, are there any, I think, I think you've mentioned a few already, but I'd love to hear a little more about what are the success stories, especially with implementation of the various interventions. Yeah, so the, the burden's largest in China, across South Asia and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, though obviously significant burdens exist in other parts of Africa, Latin America, um, kind of one-to-one -one relationship with poverty, where you see a lot of poverty, you tend to see a lot of solid fuel use. And as Kirk mentioned, a few countries have had these successful transitions. So Ecuador has had their transition first from solid fuels to gas, and now from gas to induction-powered stoves um, using inexpensive hydropower. Indonesia completed a transition from kerosene to LPG. So kerosene, while a petroleum distillate is a pretty nasty actor, releases a lot of chemicals that we think are harmful and looks to be associated with a number of bad health endpoints. So that was a positive shift. And then in China, there's been, uh, there was a large uh, National Institute uh, Improved Stove Program, I think that's what's called, but I'm not sure, um, which installed hundreds of thousands of biomass chimney stoves in village households that were pretty transformative to the households. They raised the cooking surface off the floor. They had a large platform for people to cook and work on, and they were suited for Chinese cooking. So they allowed for high firepower for walks and that sort of thing. And those have been fairly successful. Um, it's now moving to electric and gas cooking as well, because like we've mentioned, chimney stoves, while they might reduce indoor exposures a little bit, they tend to move the pollution outside causing exposure outside or exposure back in the house as the air pollution comes back in. Yeah, there have been other examples in the world. Um, Brazil, for example, uh, through policy, moved essentially everybody, 95% uh, of their households to gas, uh, to LPG. And there are other examples in Latin America and so on. But um, uh, now we have this major example in India. Um, but it's uh, important to point out that it is associated with poverty. Um, basically, poor people use solid fuels, and no rich, no rich person uses solid fuels for cooking, um, and you know, except once in a while in a barbecue. Um, but um, all the poor people do. Um, so, but poverty alleviation, you know, waiting for everybody to get rich is is too slow a process. And I think this is quite common in public health, where you're, you know, you might say we're looking for these magic levers that can make people healthy before they become wealthy. Uh, because you know, um, we can, in some cases, we know what some of those levers are, you know, cleaner water, better sanitation, uh, vaccination, you know, pub, you know, basic public health uh, services at the village level. And um, we believe that household fuels, uh, improved household fuels is another. And of course, the argument is the other way around. Once people become healthier, they're more likely to be wealthy. That is, there's an interaction in both directions. And this is a, sort of the basic premise of public health is to try to find ways to make people healthy before they're wealthy. And you might add keeping them healthy once they become wealthy. So in the chapter, some of the, what, um, well, with regard to the interventions in the chapter, you mentioned one way of Im implementing them um, would be through stacking or mixed use of these different interventions. Not, you know, it's not one major invention is going to fix the problem. Um, but can you talk about how stacking or mixed use of these different interventions is actually challenging to do? Yeah, so um, we think about stacking in a slightly different way. For us, we want to try to eliminate stacking as much as possible. For us, stacking means mixed use. And so you can give someone a clean stove, and if they don't use it or they continue to use their traditional stove, even occasionally, um, you're not going to see their exposures go down to the level we think is health protective. and. You know, in the past, the way we did this, way we assessed stacking was to go into households and ask questions about, well, how long did you use this stove? How long did you use that stove? And as you can imagine, people kind of tell you what you want to hear. So you would often hear that we used our intervention stove all the time. We stopped using our traditional stove. Um, everything's going great, but then you wouldn't see an exposure reduction. So in the last decade or so, our research group pioneered the use of low cost data logging thermometers, which we can stick on stoves and measure whether they're actually being used or not. It's kind of revolutionize the way we think about um, stacking and about mixed use and about adoption of these interventions over time. And so we can now objectively understand whether a person's using their 
new stove or their old stove or both stoves and how frequently that's happening. And so for us, um, these these SOMS stove use monitors, as we call them, made us realize that you know not only do we need to encourage people to use the new clean stove or technology or fuel, but we also have to discourage them from using the old um, stove. And we need to reduce any barriers that might be there for the use of the new stove. So that's that's kind of how we think about stacking in mixed use in household energy. Another thing, I mean, um, you know, it's like a lot of, you know, revelations um, I've had over 40 years of working in the area, I, re I realized I could have had the revelation 40 years ago, but I've only had it fairly recently, is that in one sense, it's not the problem of the new stove, it's the problem of the old stove. You have to have a way to get rid of the old, bad, unhealthy behavior. And um, what is the implication of that? One implication is that it's very hard to think of a business model. You can sell people things that are nice and they like, but then that might just sit on the shelf or only be used once a week. You actually have to get rid of the old one. And it's not very hard to think of a business model for that. So, um, but this is common again in public health. I mean, it's, um, you've got to, you, can be the, you have to get the people to use the condoms. They have to go use the latrines and so forth. And so there's a whole set of techniques that have been developed in public health or in the health sector to promote these kinds of changes in behavior. Some are, you know, more in the social science area, some uh, exerting public pressure or social pressure um, to get people to change their behavior, um, to, you know, what's been called shaming. If somebody defecates in the open, they, they should feel ashamed, just as they would and they did it in downtown Berkeley. Um, but there are also, you know, uh, conditional cash transfer techniques, giving people money, basically, for doing the right thing. And one of the things, and Ajay mentioned the sums of work that he works, that he's responsible for here. I mean, we have a device called a pink key, we call it, which basically measures the use of a stove. And, and the pregnant woman can take the pink key to her um, clinical checkup when she's pregnant, and they can um, put it in the machine. And it says, oh, you used your um, new stove for um, 100 meals, you get 200 rupees. So um, you give them small cash payments, not enough to change their lives, but enough to change their behavior. And there's been a lot of experience with this in the health field, also education. First starting in Mexico some years ago, where they increased the use of, um, increased the rate of vaccination, increased the uh, girl children staying in school and things like that with simple payments. There's some tricks to it. One of the tricks is you only give the money to the women you don't give it to men, they're much less likely to go to beer and cigarettes if it goes to the women. And the money itself has a value in the household because women tend to use it for more um, you know, family protective things than if it just went into the general coffers. So there, there's, we're trying to apply, I'm getting to the part of our research now, a good big part of it, is to learn how to use these techniques that have been developed in other parts of the health and education sectors to promote um, uh, health giving change, uh, changes in behavior. And I think that's really interesting. Like I said, I feel like this is such a topic that is a very classic uh, public health issue, as opposed to some of the other diseases that have um, interventions that are really targeted towards the individual. This one really has to address the entire community. I found that fascinating and, and, and not wouldn't even say fascinating, but just an important point that you know one person changing their behavior doesn't make a difference if the entire village is doing it because that one person who changed their behavior can still be affected by the smoke from the other community members and so i think it's it's interesting to put it in perspective with some of the other types of um diseases or disorders that uh really that even if one individual changes their behavior it puts other people at risk or, it, or they're affected by it and you bring up stuff about um public pressure or even public shaming and, and things like that. And I think it's it's interesting. I, I wonder what your thoughts are with, um, you know, maybe some of the policies that go into effect in making people to do this. I think I always think positive encourage is much better, but sometimes maybe public shaming is, but there's areas where that's sort of like controversial when we think about vaccination, but that's another thing that's important. Like if someone doesn't vaccinate a child, that does put other people at risk because then there's not maybe the herd immunity or maybe the vaccine's not, you know, it's own there's a you know a threshold of protection so um i think that's it's it's interesting um, i get a little uncomfortable sometimes with the public shaming but sometimes you know is that is it worth the the kind of the negative negative input to for a positive output well i mean um uh, uh, let me just one bit i'm sure ajay has something to say on this too but 
Um, one of my favorite stories is sitting on the Metro in Delhi, um, you know, in a crowded subway car, and there's a young man sitting next to me fondling his cigarettes. He could hardly wait to smoke, clearly. But he didn't smoke, not because it said no smoking, but because everybody in the car would jump on him if he smoked. And the anti-tobacco people have been perhaps the most successful. You know, the very first line item in the Tobacco Control Convention, the WHO convention that many con most countries have signed, is anti-smoking laws in public places, to shame people, to change the social context of smoking. Now, and there's some people who, you know, are upset about being shamed for smoking, but that's going away because people are beginning to realize it makes a better environment for everybody, and plus being more healthy for the smokers and the non-smokers. So, um, you know, we share a lot of the problems uh, or the issues uh, that are associated with um, bad sanitation. Uh, it's um, there are new technologies, but you also have to have a behavior change, and um, so we you know we learn from them. I mean, and, and then you you mentioned a very important point: this kind of community effect. There was a large study in India, you know, including a hundred villages, half of them you know, randomized to have a you know a, a latrines, the other half not. The latrine, the households, the the villages that didn't have a program they, they only had 12 percent use of latrines and the villages that did you have a program had 65 percent uses of latrines and there was no health benefit at all why is that because 65 percent is not enough if you have 35 percent of the people still defecating in the open i mean think what that would do in you know washington dc so you have to have very high levels and now and it's a little bit true with household air pollution too you have a clean fuel in the middle of a village or everybody's using wood or dung, you're going to have a dirty household as well. So you, you know, that's a you know community effect. So India actually has a program, um, not as big uh, as a more state level program on smokeless village program, where they're trying to change out every household in the village. And you clearly can't have a kind of a, you know public pressure imposed. I mean, people don't have to smoke, but they do have to cook. So you can't pressure your neighbor not to light up her biomass stove unless she has an op has a clear option. So we aren't ready, you know, for shaming or, or not. there's a there's got to be a better word, you know, the, for unleashing social pressure is what I say, uh, until we have a more, you know, complete uh, um, access to the to the alternative. But I mean, in fact, that's what you're going to have to see. I mean, if people lit up, you know, you people complain in Berkeley about too much smoke from their neighbors' fireplaces. You do and public pressure is important for for all of these issues. This is another really salient point I took from the chapter was um, talking about how, you know, people's individual preferences, they don't like the taste of the food when it's not cooked with the, like a, a biomass, biomass fuel, or when it's cooked with um, the um, LPG or something. But I, the chapter had mentioned is like, yeah, but you know, we had the same issue with condoms that people didn't like wearing them or like you said, like, like the taste of cigarettes and things like that. And yet the, the health field really did push to, to change those, those norms. And I found that uh, a nice, a nice, um, a nice example of that. Yeah. We had a, a recent experience in Tamil Nadu where we were talking to a group of villagers about, you know, what some of the barriers were for them to adopt uh, clean fuels. And, you know, the men were the problem, as is often the case. They were the loudest and most opinionated, though the women were um, pretty strong in this group. But the men were complaining about the taste and all that stuff. And the women basically said, well, that's not really a problem. Um, and if you don't like it, don't eat. And it was pretty <laughs> shocking to see. I mean, the women were on board 100% for, for a transition. They recognized the time savings associated with using a fuel as opposed to going out and gathering fuel. They recognize that taste isn't really that big of an issue and they recognize the convenience that you can just, you know, turn the dial, light a match and you've got a, a fire going to cook your food. And so that was a pretty, um, pretty revelatory little experience in the village. That was, you know, very striking, actually. Um, and also the women in this particular area, when we asked, well, you know, who makes the decision about you know, stoves and fuels? And, and they said, we do, of course. And I said, what about the mothers-in-law? You know, that was it's an issue in some places. And I said, well, who cares about them? I mean, it was it was quite something. Um, you know, my yeah. my story, apocryphal, I suppose, a bit is, you know, if I want to cook a, a, a you know, a meal cooked over a solid fuel, 
my wife says, fine, we'll take it outside and we'll call it a barbecue, but I'm not going to sit here day in, day out, have it in the kitchen. I mean, you know, it's, uh, or put another way, is it worth a million premature deaths a year because of a slight change in taste of the japati? I don't think so. But this, you know, that is, a, you know, it is a health uh, angle on it. Um, but, uh, and, but another important thing is that eating tastes change quite fast. You know, I, we've seen this in India. I mean, all of a sudden, japati is a big deal in the South. And, you know, and um, uh, South Indian uh, snack food is a big deal in the North. Uh, you know, one of the most, you know what the most common food in the world is? And it's almost everywhere. It's those little packaged noodle things that you see in every household. Those didn't exist, you know, the, these change, these, um, you know, 30 years ago. So these uh, the conditions change. And there are people who don't like the taste of, you know, charcoal on their food also. So, um, you know, um, so I, you know, I take, uh, if you don't, if mine don't mind the expression, these taste issues with a grain of salt. And, you know, <laughs> and no, salt is another thing. People get used to it. They think they like it, but then they do fine without it. You know, absolutely. I was just thinking yeah. about that salt and sugar and how, you know, we're so used to so much of the processed food and super salty that you used to. Then I've talked to people that have, I had a friend who was living in Italy for a year and he said, you know, I came back and my palate was completely changed. Yeah. So you're right. Food tastes do change. And so I, there's no reason that it couldn't and we could get used to it and be totally fine. It's just a preference at the moment. But I want to get back to the women because I think this is interesting. And it's something that the, the chapter also points out is that women and children, um, but especially women, have high exposure to the household air pollution. I understand that access is, is an important part of addressing this, you know, this issue. Um, well, I mean, and access to interventions, but what about education? I didn't, I don't remember reading a lot about this. Um, and I'm wondering if the women are aware of their, the health risk associated with these stoves. So there are a couple angles to, to that point. I think um, education is definitely important. And I, but I think for a lot of the households, our research and others' research has found that the health angle isn't actually the most compelling to people to get them to change. So it might be that their walls are black or their pots get ruined or any other number of things that might drive them towards adopting um, a clean technology. Part of that might be that we haven't done a great job with the health messaging to date, and um, it's maybe not as catered to local conditions as it needs to be. And we've been working on that um, in Maharashtra a little bit. Um, uh, a second related issue is that we we are seeing some of the health messaging get through in India as part of this big give it up campaign where the messaging specifically targeted some health endpoints. Um, I think, I don't remember the exact taglines, Kirk, you want to? Uh, yeah, uh, make a poor man's kitchen clean is that uh, was one of their major, you know, it's um, and so clean and, um, you know, keep her from crying with a picture of a woman cooking over. So they're not, you know, they don't talk about COPD or lung cancer, but they're clearly, you know, uh, cleanliness and health uh, angles. And one of them was, um, you know, make a cleaner environment for, for them and a better environment for yourself. I mean, recognizing the outdoor air pollution component too. So um, there is, uh, you know, that, that's, it's, um the thing you know survey any but the ones that have been done show that um, the biggest single factor for women well first of all it's the aspirational they see um you know lpg and then the movies and they see it on their rich neighbors have it they know it's the you know the right thing to be doing or the modern thing to do but the second thing is time savings that's really concrete for the women and it's not only time savings and not having to gather the biomass fuel well, the whole process is easier i mean you turn on the stove turn it off don't have to clean your pots it cooks everything faster that's what i mean in these village meetings we had that was clearly you know the benefit that they saw and um that you know actually is something we've been looking at and actually trying to quantify you know the potential economic benefit of the time savings and um that's another chapter in this um, book we've been sort of talking around um, and, and it was uh, Ajay's work maybe he could describe I mean we actually were able to derive a economic value for the time savings you know using I think some pretty justifiable um, means yeah I'd love to hear more about that I definitely um, I think you know the the justification to for individuals to change their behavior but also the, the economic justifications or 
economic influencers that get policymakers to implement these uh, interventions is also really important. So what did you find with um, regard to that? Sure. So what we did was we looked at um, some survey data run uh, a few years ago that looked at how long people by state spent collecting fuel. So how much time they spent every day or every week going out to gather fuel for their cooking needs. And it varied widely. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but we were able to take that um, time spent and calculate how much time that means they collect fuel over a year and then look at um, what their wage rate would be. So India has a program called the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, and it guarantees people in rural areas a certain amount of employment um, per year at a certain wage rate. And that wage rate changes per state. So we, the nice thing about this metric is that we're actually able to assign a value to that time spent gathering fuel. So you're losing guaranteed economic uh, inputs or wages. Um, and what we found was that the combination of those wages and averted medical costs were pretty significant, it's significant enough to make a variety of different interventions actually look pretty appealing to the households. And that ranged from um, chimney stoves to LPG and other intervention stoves. And, you know, part of the reason a chimney stove looks appealing is because the upfront cost is very low. The, the savings, both in terms of time and medical costs, were also much lower than if you were to transition to LPG, where your health benefits are potentially much greater and your time savings are much, much greater because you're gathering basically no fuel. And so we think those are pretty instructive findings. And we only looked in one state in India, and we're hoping to kind of expand that analysis to look at a number of different states where there's a lot of solid fuel use and a lot of fuel gathering behavior. But we think it it indicates that um, programs that look may look very expensive up front actually aren't that expensive. And another thing we found is that when we were doing some interviews recently, people haven't necessarily made that connection between the their time savings and the the wages they could earn. And so making that connection, you could kind of see light bulbs go off in the room when we did that. Um, and we think that that's an important part of some future messaging. And indeed, it might even be worthwhile trying to tie the two programs together so that if you're getting a clean fuel, you also get some information about this rural employment guarantee. Yeah, I mean, that's a, um, a good point. A point I wanted to make, and, and uh, Jay has led into it, is, um, you know, the current program uh, is a massive thing, uh, and it's ending in 2019. And the reason why 2019 is because it's just before the next election. And Modi, you know, this is um, Prime Minister Modi's, um, one of his um, jewels in the crown, if you like. Um, very successful program. It's, um, although it has some criticism, it's generally considered quite successful and he wants to use it, I'm sure, the, for his next campaign. But it doesn't cover the whole country. 350 million is maybe half the problem in the country. So, um, what are you going to do next? How do you target this even better? How do you make the argument even more in this, you know, let's call it Ujwala 2 or the second round of this thing? So that's what we are working on is the evidence base that can be used to design the new program. Because I don't, first of all, I don't think we can affect the current program. It's got this vast thing and just going on its own course. But and one of the ways is to, um, and we're studying in the Maharashtra, is um, to um, uh, target it through pregnant women. Pregnant women are a vulnerable group. Their behavior is changing anyway. Giving them special benefits is accepted by everybody because they're a special group. It's over in nine months. Even if you, if it costs um, a lot during that nine months, you know, you're not subsidizing them forever. So we think there's a real um, potential for um, giving pregnant women free fuel for nine months and then hope she likes it and um, will continue to use it afterwards. Another, and that would, how, however, that requires linking with the health sector. Um, right now, this done program is done only entirely within, you might say, the petroleum sector, um, but it doesn't link with any other programs. But the second way to do it, we link it with this rural employment scheme. So, for example, if you sign up for LPG, you get you know some extra days on that scheme. And so you could pay for the LPG with the wages from the, the saved time. So these are you know, things we're exploring now. And those are two really concrete and I think potentially doable things, but we have to, you know, I mean, we have to show that, it, that they have effect. Now, one thing you said earlier is like, yeah, and, and also in the chapter as well was, you know, there needs to be a great good business model to implement a lot of, the, you know, the transition to using cleaner fuel, which, you know, I just was thinking about this and I was wondering, um, 
one, I fully agree on that, but two, who's going to be interested in this business all besides the health people, but the industry, right? And are there any public private partnerships that are working with health groups or NGOs to do stuff like that and coming up with, you know, interesting initiatives to get use? Because you, you would think it would be the, the LPG companies or the people making these stoves that would be interested, like you said, getting people started on them and then, you know, hoping they like it to continue. Well, let me, let me say um, um, the um, the new program um, that in, is aiming at um, basically 60 million households, 350 million people, has as part of it um, the hiring of a whole um, bunch of new distributors. Um, there are 18,000 distributors of LPG in the country now, and many with 20 or 30 employees. So there's a big, it's an army out there, but most of them, of course, are in near cities or in, because that's where it's easy to sell LPG and has been. But in order to reach these um, new people, the poor people, basically many of them or most of them are out in rural areas and more remote, more, you know, more diff the roads are more difficult and they, you know, the monsoon is a bigger effect. And so um, the, the, business arrangements for those new distributors. They're, oh, they're saying they're, they're planning to hire 10,000 new distributors. Well, I mean, that's a part of the program that hasn't moved very fast because partly because there are a lot of, you know, sort of um, the long pipeline and getting permissions. But secondly, I think it's more difficult. I mean, exactly what the business model is for those rural, you no know, more remote distributors is not so easy. And then, so they are starting to look at self-health groups, you know, women's um, organizations, agricultural cooperatives, mm -hmm. other types of uh, groups that, um, um, you know, do other things so they don't have to make all their profit on LPG, but couldn't, but are out there in those rural areas. But you've identified, I think, an important point is that they, um, I don't think they can, they can't cover the entire country only with the Ministry of Petroleum, yep. basically. I mean, part of the part of the challenge is that the you know for a lot of these households, the upfront cost of the cylinder, that is the fuel to refill, is is quite high. And so, we're working with some groups who are looking into sort of pay as you go schemes. So the way you might think about recharging a cell phone or prepaying for a certain amount of fuel or paying for smaller quantities of fuel um, to try to ease that barrier. And so there's some innovative business models we think there, but they they have a long way to go before they're ready to roll out in these rural areas. Um, Basically, you I mean we've sort of hinted around it, but there, I think there are three constraints. Um, we sort of identify three. I suppose you could subdivide them, but one is the information constraint. People don't understand the benefits, uh, both you know, to themselves, the, the saved um, time, and also the health benefits. Uh, and then second is the access issue. I mean, people have have to have. Um, access and uh, that access has to be reliable you know if you run out of fuel on saturday night and you can't get your new refill until friday you know what are you going to do you're going to go back to biomass so you have to have a much more reliable fuel supply and in cities in india that's dealt with by having two cylinders 43 percent of the connections in india have two so you never run out it doesn't matter if you can't get it refilled right away because you've got another cylinder to use and personally you know, I think that's what's going to have to happen in the whole country. And the last thing, of course, is cost. There are people who, you know, uh, this is right on the edge of their affordability. And uh, one, you know, problem is, you know, coming up with, the, let's say, 450 rupees to get a refill is um, much, you know, once a month is, um, but if you could, they could do it 15 rupees a day, it will be a lot more likely. So um, there are, you know, schemes to do that. Maybe, you know, they deposit, somebody comes by and collects the money each day or even machines. I mean, there's a new valve called the smart valve. It sits on the cylinder and you can actually order the uh, one day's worth of fuel, excuse me, on your cell phone. So new technology. So, any, so anyway, trying to break all of these barriers of, um, you know, the information access and um, the cost. I think it's a good place to end. And I think like I enjoyed reading the chapter and learning about this. I wasn't as familiar with this topic, but you guys did a really good job of laying out the burden and, and all the challenges associated with really addressing the issue. Um, and it's I think it's it's something that's not as familiar to people in Western countries, um, but it's important to 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 bring up.
So I'm, I'm glad we were able to talk about it today. So thank you for joining me uh, and talking about it with us. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So let me also just thank our viewers for tuning in. And I just want to mention that we love to hear back from you and let us know what you think about this issue um, by commenting on the video or tweeting at us. And we would encourage you to check out more of our videos on our webpage or by subscribing to our YouTube channel. Um, and you can find out more about us at both places. You can also find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and we have a blog. And if you prefer to listen rather than watch, we also have an audio podcast that is on iTunes. So again, thank you, Kirk and Ajay, for joining me today. And to our viewers, we'll see you next time.